alumna of the Alliance Manchester Business School, uh, and I joined the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research just last week. Um, so this is uh, my first time at a scale event, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, the scale forum is a peer-to-peer -peer network for ambitious scaling up uh, businesses in the Northwest. It gives businesses of all stages of scale um, the opportunity to share experiences, challenges, and lessons learned uh, for mutual business benefit. The scale forum is led by our business engagement and knowledge exchange team with support from the internationally recognized knowledge and expertise of Alliance Manchester Business School. And it's a very important initiative of the university. The business engagement team facilitates collaborations between our academic researchers and the business community. And that's what brings us here today, helping to match business need and real world challenges to our academic expertise, ensuring our research is informed by our partners and providing routes to real impact for academic invest, invest, endeavors. Sorry. This afternoon, we will explore how successful companies incorporate innovation strategies and how they manage and support innovation throughout the business. Following our speakers, I'll be back to lead a Q&A, so please take note of your questions uh, online and in the room, and we'll be glad to uh, take all of those. So I'll introduce Professor Bruce Tether uh, from the Alliance Manchester Business School. He will start us off today with a presentation. Bruce is Professor of Innovation Management and Strategy. He's the Associate Head of Research for the Innovation Management and Policy Division, and the Research Director of the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center, led by Nesta in London. He teaches innovation management and his research interests center around three interrelated themes, innovation and entrepreneurship through creativity and design, the competitive dynamics of professional service firms, especially those oriented to design and creativity, such as architecture practices, design and engineering consultancies, and as well as how firms make choices regarding their geographical, geographical locations for competitive advantage. Yeah. Over to you. I don't have time for this with all that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for the introduction. Thanks to Abby, Becca, and Rachel for organizing this event. And uh, it's my pleasure to give you the uh, textbook version of how you do this before we have, as I'll tell you how to do it in reality, real practice. So, okay. So, this is about uh, achieving innovation and innovation strategies. I actually turn it around and start thinking about strategies first before thinking about achieving innovation. Okay, so, so what is innovation, right? Innovation is a nice popular topic. Everybody wants to be an innovator these days. So what is it? Um, so it has lots of definitions. Here's a very simple one. It's the set successful implementation of new ideas. Perhaps a rather big, uh, broad definition, but um, so a slightly narrow one is innovation is the implementation of significantly improved products or processes or marketing methods or organizational methods, business practices, workplace uh, organizations or external relations. That comes from the OECD. So again, it's a big space. You can do lots of different types of innovation. There's not one type of innovation. What about a few myths about innovation? There are lots of myths about innovation. So one of the big myths is that innovation starts with invention. You invent something in your, uh, in your shed, perhaps, and then you think it's a bit of genius, and you decide to go out and market it, and that's the start of your innovation journey. Another myth of uh, innovation, and uh, is something which the uh, politicians are often guilty of, is they associate or they um, equate innovation with doing research and development in particular, do research, right? You kind of always, always need to do some development for achieving innovation, but you don't need to do research, okay? So especially you don't need to do scientific and technological research. You may do, but often you don't, right? I personally am a big fan of design and development as an approach to innovation, which is a bit different from research and development. But you may know that the, the government has an aim to increase our, our GDP spend on R&D to about 2.5%, which is a very laudable aim um, in this uh, time, but personally, I think it's uh, not really the right way to go about innovating if you're a smaller business seeking to go rapidly. Another myth about innovation is that it's best to be first, right? As, as a kind of pioneering thing, it's always best to be the first with your uh, first market. Well, a lot of innovation is not like that. A lot of innovation is actually imitating or doing something similar to someone else, right? In many ways, there are advantages of not being first, right? There are disadvantages of being first. Because if you're first, you have to prove the technology. You then have to prove the market. So let's take an example, okay? We all 
familiar with uh, Mr. Dyson and his vacuum cleaner, his bagless vacuum cleaner, right? Went on to be an enormous success. How did it start? Started by Dyson being unhappy with how his, his, his vacuum cleaner worked. Basically, it vacuumed the floor for a bit, got clogged up with dust, and it didn't work very well. He thought this is a bad product. Okay. So then he became a bit obsessed with how to make it a better product. Okay. And eventually was able to make a, a proper product and start selling it. But there are many types of uncertainty he had to overcome in developing this product. I mean, first of all, he had to make an alternative version to the conventional bag vacuum cleaner. And secondly, so that was a sort of technological uncertainty, but also he had this uncertainty of would it sell, right? Did anybody else think the bagless vacuum cleaner, the bag vacuum cleaner was actually a bad product, right? That the bagless one would be so much better, right? So clearly people did, right? Because they went out and bought it. Lesser known story is that Dyson actually had another product which wasn't so successful. This was the uh, washing machine, which washed in two different directions, right? It's kind of a similar idea in a way to the, back, the bagless vacuum cleaner in that it was a washing machine which washed the clothes better. In this case, however, nobody really noticed the difference, right? And they weren't paid, were prepared to pay the big price premium uh, for, for, the, for getting the, uh, the slightly better washing machine, right? So sometimes it's better not be first. You can observe instead someone else doing a product really well and say, well, I'll have a bit of that. I'll do something similar to that. And then you overcome all uh, market uncertainties as well as technological uncertainties. Another myth is that innovation is disruptive, okay? So we often think, oh, well, innovation is disruptive, is gonna change the way things are, right? So, but a lot of innovation is not disruptive, right? A lot of innovation, in fact, the vast majority of innovation is incremental, right? It's cumulative, small changes. So we don't, so it's not about making things suddenly dramatically better. I remember a study I did a few years ago, which was about increasing capacity, runway capacity at Heathrow Airport, okay? And this was a, a lot of innovations, small innovations in how the a runway was utilized, right? And it had a combined effect to increase capacity, but it wasn't a disruptive innovation. It didn't sort of suddenly think, let's get rid of the runway and put a big helipad in there or something crazy, right? It wasn't, you know, so people tend to think about innovation as being this disruptive force. It can be, but it doesn't have to. Anyone think of any other myths about innovation? Anyway, we're going to have a bit of fun about myths about innovation, but these are some of the myths, okay? So broadly, innovation is two different things, right? Two different areas or zones. One is what we call product innovation in broad sense, right? Product innovation is what you provide to your customers, okay? So what is it you are selling? Why is it that someone would want something new or improved, such as a new improved vacuum cleaner or a new improved washing machine, okay? Improved also includes new services, new experiences, doesn't have to be a physical product. The other is processes and organizational changes. So how do we do what we do, right? So maybe we can make the same product with a different process. We refine the process, we reduce a unit cost, and we're more, more efficient in doing so. So uh, with services especially, there's often a kind of conflation of the two things, right? The service is the process and vice versa. But broadly, there are these two big zones of innovation. Product innovation generally gets a lot more kind of attention of credit than process and organization. Now, here's the news, folks. The UK is not very good at innovating, right? Or at least the UK doesn't innovate very much. This is a survey that the government undertakes every uh, second year and it asks firms, have you introduced a new or improved product or service our new or improved process in the last three years. How many firms do you think said, yes, we have? And how many said, oh, we haven't? Well, it turns out if you look at product innovation, about one in five companies with at least 10 employees said they've made a new or improved product in the last three years, okay? That means four fifths haven't, okay? So right, it kind of doesn't change a lot, right? In three years, you haven't improved your product. Or, uh, or introduce something new. Process innovation is even worse, right? Whoops. Process innovations are even worse. It's kind of down between about 15%. This is amazing, right? I mean, process innovation is an opportunity to become more efficient at what you do. And yet only about 15% of British firms with 10 or more employees are reporting that they do process innovation to the ONS's survey of many thousands of firms, right? So why does this matter? It matters for companies which are um, growth orientated and have ambition 
Innovation is fundamentally a way to grow, right? It's a way to expand your market by offering new and better products. And it's a way to improve your efficiency by doing process innovation. So the fact that British firms don't innovate very much is really worrying. There's a, there, there are kind of some more firms that are innovation active with we expand the definition to things like changing your strategy or changing business processes. But still, you know, less than half of our companies are innovation active in an, even a really good one. So how should we go about innovating, right? So there are two keys to innovation. One is doing the right projects, and the other is doing projects well, right? Okay, so let me discuss first doing the right projects. The right projects have to connect with strategy. What is your strategy? What is your objective? So firms can have different strategies. Growth is a strategy. Uh, profit maximizing is a strategy. Being, being sustainable is a strategy. But according to Alfred D. Chandler, one of the founders of strategy, it's about long-term goals and objectives of the enterprise and adopting a course of action and allocating resources necessary to carry out these goals. Okay, so strategy is what you're trying to achieve. Has three basic elements, these objectives. So what are you trying to achieve? Who, what, what would you like to do? Sometimes strategy is merely survival, right? So if you're in a busy, very contested industry, you might just want to survive. You may want to grow. This is a scale up forum, so firms on this program should want to grow, right? You need to understand your, your environment. Uh, there's different elements of this, but uh, for example, how can you can you protect your intellectual property, right? Is you, are you existing in a regime in which you can protect your intellectual property, or is your intellectual property very vulnerable to copy, all right, or imitation? Thirdly, resourcing and developing the capabilities you need in order to undertake the strategy. So we can think of different strategies for different firms, even in the same industry or activity. So for example, let's say you are a uh, inventor or invention-led, discovery-led business, and you have discovered some new chemical entity, right? Maybe a pharmaceutical or drug. Now your strategy is likely to be built around how you can protect that. Okay, so it's a protection-based strategy. You need to know about intellectual property rights. You probably need to know about the limitations of intellectual property rights, the role of secrecy, the role of reputation. These sort of things come into play. How aggressive are our, our opponents in the industry? Okay. Let's say you're following a different strategy. Your strategy is said to be a fast follower. Okay, you don't want to be first. Your strategy is to see what is emerging on the market and basically imitate that as soon as possible, right? You're trying to not, you're not inventing first. So, okay, so your, your strategy is different and the resources you need are different, okay? It's an agility strategy. It's about maintaining the ability to jump into new areas very quickly, okay? Very different, very different uh, relationships between the objectives and the resources and environment. Let me put that in a more um, empirical way. Here are two, Different architecture practices, okay? At the top is Zaha Hadid, okay? It became a big architecture practice based on design-led unique solutions, okay? Amazing buildings, but it's it's about de developing these bespoke amazing buildings, whereas down here is a totally different architecture practice. Its business is delivery-led, okay? It's about delivering on time, on budget, being dependable, repeatable solutions. So you basically build the same building over and over again, and you do economies through building it over and over again. Totally different strategies of firms in the same industry. Okay. So how do you think about strategy and innovation? As you can use something like the uh, business model canvas, which was developed by Alexander Osterwalder. Anyone seen this thing? Okay, this is a fantastic tool, I think, for thinking about your business model and how to uh, innovate in your business model. On one side, we think about the demand side focus. <clears throat> Who is your customer? Who are the customer segments you're trying to attend to? What do they want, right? This is your value proposition and your customer. So if we go to the two architecture practices, their customer segments are very different, right? One wants grand, grand, iconic architecture. The other one's delivery, right? The other one's building student hall residence or something like this, right? How do you interact? What are your customer interaction channels? So we're going to think about that and our opportunities to innovate on the demand side. You know, maybe you've got to change the nature of product, change the way in which you interact with your customers. On the supply side, we can think about the, what you need to do 
those activities, okay? So you're going to think about the key resources you need, the key activities you need. So for example, you, you're probably going to need different types of architects, right? If you're going to follow these two different types of uh, routes in, in the architecture industry in particular, right? You're going to need uh, more of a mind for efficiency, delivery on time than uh, developing uh, wonderful shapes, uh, for example. Okay, so these are kind of great. This is great. So what I do with my students is I ask them to look at an existing business model, and we, we compare an existing business model. We compare and contrast against a revised one. I got a couple of minutes. How long have I got? Okay. So the other key to um, to uh, to innovating is doing projects well, right? So you're going to know your space, and you're going to know what uh, you know what types of uh, projects you're going to do in your space. A project which might be right for someone else isn't going to be right for you and vice versa, okay? But then when we come to looking at how to do projects well, this is about doing projects in a, in a way that has discipline, okay? So the danger with innovation projects is they're subject to drift. And they're subject to people saying, oh, well, this is my baby. I'm going to look after my baby. I love this idea. I'm going to keep it, you know, and they basically just want their idea forever. This is particularly difficult where the project kind of the, the business owner, right? So often with small businesses, it's the owner, manager has the idea, and nobody's going to tell him or her to no, stop. You're, you're kind of a bit of a loony on this, right? It's not going to work, right? So what you want is some discipline. So innovation, someone's got some time in these slides. So some of this innovation is can be seen as a staged process, okay? So it doesn't, it's not one thing. We go through different stages. So first of all, we discover, we discover what might be, what might be desirable by our customers, what might be possible in terms of refining our processes. Then we define what it is we're trying to achieve. Then we spend time in development, right? This is about turning your ideas into something more tangible, more more practically implementable. And then you move on to delivering it. You can, and one of the keys to, uh, to innovation is deciding when to, to kill it, right? When to stop. We should always evaluate an innovation pro project on its prospects going forward, not how much you've spent on it in the past, okay? We call that the sunk cost fallacy. It's a bit like Concord, right? We kept going with Concord because we thought we spent all this money in the past. We can't give up on it. Or you might think HS2 is a bit like that. That's a controversial topic, right? But you, know, you should really evaluate it on what it's going to cost you from tomorrow onwards, not how much you've already spent on it. I remember one of the questions I was asked for this is, should everybody contribute? Well, yes and no. Everybody should be involved, I think, in the front end, providing ideas, but not necessarily in evaluating, especially not evaluate, right? It's not a democracy. It's not like, how many people in this company think this is a good idea to do? And uh, people put their hands up. And people kind of look at the boss and see if the boss put his hand up. Like, oh, I put my hand up because the boss put his hand up, right? So don't do that, right? Evaluate things independently of proposing things. Okay. Why is the front end particularly important? Front end is where you generate ideas, but it's also particularly important because it's very cheap, right? If you can do the front end of innovation well, you can observe and get lots of ideas for innovation, right? Cheaply. If you have skills associated with it, design skills in particular are good at understanding, empathizing what might, what might be different, right? Look for what we call points of pain, right? Where are your customers' points of pain? What hurts them? Try to, uh, try to understand their points of pain and start to, to address them. But generally through innovation processes, our costs will increase, right? First bit is cheap, the middle bit is pretty expensive, but delivery, especially getting delivery wrong, is very expensive. Right. So you've got to think about this and kill off innovation projects which aren't successful, aren't likely to be successful early on. What you want to do is actually start with lots of ideas here and cut them out. Right. So I sometimes use the analogy of straws in a straws in a glass. So we have lots of straws in a glass. Everybody's taking a sip. Then the water, the resource for innovation gets uh, basically spread amongst everybody. Too many projects, too thinly spread. Better to have one straw in the glass and all the resource going to that. So start off with lots of ideas, have one straw in the glass by the middle, right? And then implement it. Think about the cost. Then there's another good tool, I think, for, for innovation, or at least for kind of basic forms of innovation. It's called the stage gate process. Anyone come across the stage gate process? 
So stage gates is not a new idea. So it's been put around by a guy called Robert Cooper, I think in the early 80s, but it's an old tool, right? But old tools are sometimes good tools. You don't necessarily need to innovate your tools, right? It start basically what it does is has stages and then assessment gates. So you want to take a stage that you investigate the possibility of doing something for your customers or even looking for their pain points, right? You then give a presentation to the gatekeepers the gatekeepers evaluate what you've done and allow you or not to proceed, right? And you basically go through these stage gates, uh, stage gate evaluation, stage gate evaluation. This has this has some benefits, right? One is that it gives a time discipline to innovation. You're told, okay, great work, but so come back next month and give us stage two. It stops drift doesn't allow the project to just drift on and because people tend to sort of work on their innovation projects on Friday afternoon and then they're not making a lot of progress, right? This gives a kind of time to split. It also, it also separates evaluation of the project from the doing of the project, okay? So we don't get to mark our own homework. This is a big problem with innovation, right? If you get to mark your own homework, especially if you're the boss of a company, you say, yeah, yeah, of course, it's a brilliant idea that I'm developing here, right? But you, you want to separate that. You want someone else or some other group of people to be evaluating your work and telling you, well, you know, this could be improved or that, right? It doesn't always have to flow down the chart all the way. You can, you can if you like, put it on the back burner, you can stop it. But basically, this is also, this is also about sort of traffic lights. Yeah, should it go forward? Should it be stopped? Should it be revised? Discipline, really important to put the discipline on the process. Typically, you're involving more and more senior decision makers as you go down this uh, process, partly because costs are also escalating. Go back to a previous slide. Okay, so have a discipline. It's not just got a free for all being a crazy and creative innovation. It is a managed process. Okay, so here's my summary. So innovation matters for business growth. It's really hard to think of any business which hasn't grown through innovating, right? How do you grow without innovating? It's quite hard to know. Any, anyone think of a business that's grown without innovating? Just to be kind of counterfactual, right? Hard to think of a business which hasn't innovated. One business that did grow phenomenally with very little innovation was Coca-Cola, actually, between when they invented Coca-Cola and uh, when they started getting to all sorts of drinks, right? But that doesn't work anymore, okay? They, they were very successful, but the vast majority of businesses can't grow without either product, process innovation, or indeed both, right? And surprisingly, very few UK firms uh, innovate or have a small proportion, right? So there's a big opportunity space, I think, for more innovative companies. Secondly, what innovations to pursue depends crucially on your strategy, okay? So the connection between strategy and innovation should be clear. The right innovations for one company are the wrong innovations for another company and vice versa. So don't all follow the same strategy. Use the business model canvas to explore opportunities for innovation. It's a brilliant tool for looking at what you're doing now. Use the canvas once for thinking, what am I doing now? And use a second canvas to think about what we might do instead. Okay, nice. I get my students to do that. I think they like it. Thirdly, managing innovation well also matters. Have a discipline about it, right? Be prepared to kill off your projects. Don't just allow them to drift. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Fantastic. I feel like that was a mini MBA class on innovation, which was uh, very, very, very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Azhar Kayu. Um, he's joined us today. He's the director and founder of Q Sustain Limited. He's an entrepreneur and engine, engineering professional with 20 years experience within sustainable design and delivery across different sectors, such as mixed use, commercial, and in particular, rail. Uh, he's creating first of its kind of achievements across complex projects. This is coupled with invaluable experience and practical major programs and extensive knowledge of the feasibility, design, and implementation stages of these projects. With his experience, he now runs a successful consultancy uh, that is well-placed to expand and diversify. He has a rare and exclusive combination of engineering design, sustainability, and practical project, ma project management experience, all very valuable, um, and with knowledge of how to implement low carbon and sustainable developments from concept design and procurement to construction and operation. Over to you, Azhar, with the practitioner perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, so, so back to Paul, it's a great presentation there from Professor Bruce, uh, but I'll give it a go. So um, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me here at the Business School. Uh, so yeah, as I per year, to be a chartered engineer. Uh, so I'm born and bred in Mancunia, stayed here uh, on my thought, travelled elsewhere in other projects. And um, we found a key sustain within our ninth year now. And um, a lot of it was actually the dream and the skill to, to be innovative, really. A lot of what we do is about innovation. And from a young age, um, you know, family was quite, found it quite tough as an immigrant family coming to Manchester. Um, I always saw my father as a great motivator for me because he was always full of great ideas, which is one of, one of them I'm going to touch on today. Um, but for me, it was a case of uh, in the opportunity that I'm going to talk about today was about the space of sustainability and how product innovation and process didn't come together where there's a real desire and need and the pinch points that Professor Bruce talked about uh, we see in, in the clients that we work with. Um, but a lot of the work we do is around low carbon technology, sustainability, product, uh, uh, process engineering, design uh, within low carbon and air quality is what we do a lot of work in as well. And predominantly we are within the rail sector, we have moved into the housing sector as well as social housing and looking at low carbon, carbon neutral kind of houses as well uh, for certain local authorities as well, which we've, we've, we've gone into as well. Um, and we do a lot of studies around this uh, energy efficiency, carbon neutral studies, and looking at different types of technology solutions. The ones that you probably hear about now in the news, like heat pump technology, uh, LED lighting and controls. But in terms of the need and how this was born about and how we started with Q Sustain was, I worked on a, a very big, one of the biggest refurbishments in Europe at the time from 2008-9, um, which was a redevelopment of a big main train station within Birmingham, Birmingham Institute Station. And what we found here was um, there was lots of challenges around the station because one of them was keeping the station operational um, through the through the works and the construction phase of, the, of this um, project. And it was nearly three quarters of a billion pound, I'm talking about six, seven hundred million pound project. And as I started life into the project coming into the engineering role and engineering management role, uh, we were finding that there was lots of challenges around trying to be a sustainable project in respect to its energy. And in particular, there's other issues around how do you insulate? We've got loads of uh, uh, other requirements on disability acts, et cetera, to get more entrances exits. What we found was the fact that the, we're doubling the energy demand because we're creating a station four times the size it used to be. You know, number of 28 US collectors, 31 new lifts to create a lot of connectivity around the station that didn't exist before because lots of pinch points there. And to me, that just didn't sit right. In, forget about the whole business perspective and trying to then create a company from all this. Just really, it just didn't get that right feeling that how can I work on a project where we've got climate change and climate action becoming an increasing topic? And here we are on a very high profile scheme where we've not really thought about how to create a low carbon project. And yet we're doubling the energy demand and we're asking the energy grid to double this supply with big transformers and lots of infrastructure there. And that's really where, to me, I thought we've got to do things differently here. And hence the innovation side, probably in me, as well as the entrepreneurial. So I can't, we can't just carry on like this or not just this project, but loads of projects that are like this as we're going into a stage where our climate action, climate awareness is such a big topic. So for me, when we started out, it wasn't just right. I, I want to be entrepreneurial. I want to open a business and I want to do X, Y, and Z and become very successful. Yes, profit is important for every company um, as well as the innovation side. But for me, the bigger thing was the purpose. And if I could balance the two, then I'd be a very happy person trying to grow a company in that way. And both are required. And at the time, going back 10 years, it wasn't so much the case. This was always questioned more than that was. And I was always seen as a disruptor, but also a troublemaker in a lot of the projects I work on, not just on, on train stations. But now we're getting into the world of CSR and ESGs and now, you know, stock markets and all these big business people and finance people now actually looking at the credentials of companies and their links towards fossil fuels and, uh, and climate action. And they're actually becoming more attractive, more, more attractive more sustainable companies are now, the more they go looking at ESGs and CSRs, and we get lots of inquiries now about this. Um, but the fact is that going forward, we're going to growing population. The next eight years, we're going to be over eight and a half billion. And we're going to need a lot more energy, water, food. We've got a lot of emerging markets. We've got developing economies. And they're all going to need a slice of the cake. And in a time where climate change is, is absolutely real and the catastrophes are happening around us, um, but for us, it was a case of recognising this and coming up with solutions and innovations to help create more sustainable developments. But whereas traditionally, a lot of people in our realm of consultancy were around this stage of creating concepts and designs 
and then sending them out to the uh, clients and saying, there you go, we've done a study on how to be more efficient on how to create renewable technologies. For us, the key is to keep with the client and go through the whole project cycle to look at how you procure that technology. How do you then build it? How do you get the right contractors and capabilities and experiences on board? Because a lot of things start to fall over when you're going out to tender on new ideas and is, is the skills there with the skill sources that we see. And then we want to still stay on board as we commission, maintain, and have back to these kind of solutions uh, based on sustainable development. And for me, even more um, personal now is the fact that, as I mentioned, climate change and climate action is, is, is real. I've had family members in, uh, in, in native Pakistan, where my, where my parents are from, suffering from the consequences of climate change. And if you look at Pakistan, an area the size of Great Britain is recently underwater and directly linked to climate change because of unprecedented rainfall, more than two and a half thousand glaciers in the north melting at alarming rates. And you've seen massive flooding, never seen on, on a scale before. As I mentioned, I've got personal family members that suffered from that in the city of Karachi. Luckily, they're okay. But the fact is that, you know, this is real and it's happening. And this is more important as innovation. That's not just a case of profit-led innovation, but purpose-led innovation. And now I feel we're in a stage where the two can actually come together. It can still be very profitable, but still be more sustainable in your innovation and your solutions. <laughs> and for us, we look at the whole triple bottom line that you've probably heard before on the three pillars of sustainability. Yes, we want to be environment responsible in terms of carbon reduction and energy efficiency and ecology biodiversity, all these solutions that we now come up with our clients in reducing waste from landfill. But we always look at the economics and make sure there's a business case there. And that's more um, positive now because of the unfortunate increase in, in energy prices. But obviously, it's creating an issue with, with fuel poverty. So we try to link them all. We try to, for example, get heat networks with, with the clients and developers say, OK, there's a social housing scheme over there. Let's take a heat network towards there as well as benefiting the development we're working on to alleviate fuel poverty. And then we look at new, new upcoming legislation. But the things that we do work in as well within rail is we look at, as I mentioned, heat networks, look at alternative technologies in air quality for diesel exhaust emissions on stations. We're just looking at alternative forms of uh, PV from roofs to solar carports. Uh, we do laws of carbon neutral feasibilities, energy efficiencies, and we're doing first of its kind carbon neutral studies for stations. And we're targeted an area where the biggest kind of um, issues arise in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and carbon, because nearly 40% of the emissions are from buildings and infrastructure and transports is, is closer behind this. But this is where we really need to tackle a lot of the issues. And the clients that we work with, we don't really network rail, we work with obviously fancy rail now and Northern as the train operators. They've also got the added issue of increased cost as well. So when I talk about the triple bottom line, it's not just obviously about targeting carbon, but it's also targeting cost. And now it's becoming more, also more, more, more um, highlighted the fact that their energy price increase, you know, nearly net rail going to be up to, towards a billion pound in energy costs to run the railway, run the train, to run all their infrastructure and the two and a half thousand stations that they, 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 they landlord for as well. And so at the same time, they're recognizing that they need to decarbonize as well. They need to be able to first to set science based targets as well and target their impacts to global uh, emissions and the limits one and a half degrees. But what we find is it doesn't always need a very technical and scientific approach. When we're going in and looking at a lot of these stations and infrastructure and assets, we find that these heating switched on in waiting rooms and areas that there's nobody sat there, no lights is left on. So we're looking at photo cells and passive infrared technologies for lighting and setting for heating. And we look at other improvements where lighting has been over, over been maintenance going on and photo cell technology that is there. Someone's put an override on it because of the maintenance and the swaps forgot to reset it. So we find all sorts of, of, of situations where these are quick wins, but they'll save a hell of a lot of energy when you separate that out across many hundreds of stations. But then, as I mentioned, we then go further into trying to manage the solutions, implement the solutions, um, come with different technologies and, and uh, implementation measures. And then we go into the low carbon technologies of what's out there in terms of wind, solar, heat pumps, what we can implement. And then we look at different methodologies that are accredited because clients want accreditations on the projects. One of them is the BRIAM, I don't know if you heard of BRIAM, but Building Research Establishments Environmental Assessment Method. Because when you're looking at efficiencies and, and new technologies and you're looking at new projects, what clients often want is a stamp to say, well, I want to be recognized for the work that we're doing. And we said, great. So we embark on courses and we'll, we'll, we'll try to make sure that they get that stamp they're looking for and that project can be benchmarked against others. So if you're a brilliant project, your building might be rated good, very good, excellent, outstanding. 
in HS2, for example, on their new stations and now trying to achieve a pretty high level of outstanding. Um, now, speaking of HS2, I know Professor Bruce mentioned, mentioned them as well in terms of the project, it is controversial, no doubt, but they are trying to really increase the game in terms of environmental sustainable performance. Um, and although, unfortunately, they are going through some you know, green belt areas and they've got a lot of scrutiny around this, they're really trying to up uh, the game in terms of the contractor performance around the build uh, projects that they're doing across the phase one and phase two. Um, so, for example, in the hybrid bill, the, the Revenue Railway Act, they've put this environmental uh, minimum requirements in there. So contractors have to track their carbon uh, in terms of transportation, track the materials and air quality needs to be measured and, and monitored as well. But what we found is we did a piece of work to see what that bar was against normal kind of contractor level within the rail sector. And we found there was a, there was a gap there. And in terms of that gap, it was, it was a case of you know, contractors were not ready in terms of looking at electric um, diggers and machinery and equipment and looking at hybrid vehicles and de decarbonizing their fleet away from diesels and petrol vehicles. Um, and when they try to, and they're coming to enter in the site uh, that's managed by HS2, they need to identify the carbon, the air quality rating, so the euro code rating of the vehicle instead of air quality. And these were all being done on spreadsheets and being done by hand with people logging number plates and things and then sending that back to HSC. We've said, hang on a second, this is really old school. And then the innovation side came out and I thought, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And then we then, I went away and I started to speak to some software developers. We started to put an app together and say, well, wouldn't it be great if all this was managed by an app on site and where was at the gate of the, at the site? can automatically do AMPR, automatic number recognition, log the vehicle coming in, that will identify its euro code in terms of its air quality. It will identify what, what uh, materials are coming in, where it's come from, so the transportation carbon, and where it's going to. Uh, we can log machinery coming in, all sorts of data. And everything is about data, especially when you're trying to decarbonize. So if you don't know what your benchmark is and where you are, you don't know where, how you, where you're going, really. Um, so this is one side of an area that we're working quite closely in. And, as Professor Bruce mentioned, this is one actually that's been going on for some time, but we're not going to kill it. We are going to try to make sure this happens because we know there's a need for it. And when we talk about these pinch points and what hurts the client, there's a lot of its reputation because now even contractor world and construction is definitely at the poorer scale in terms of sustainability because it's very hard to track and capture data. And that's one of the big challenges. And that's something that we definitely want to change. Another area where we're very, very big on innovation is air quality. So we manage a lot of issues around air quality across the whole network through network rail, particularly more enclosed stations like Birmingham New Street. If anyone's been to Birmingham, they'll probably know that when you stop and you can probably smell some diesel emissions at times when a train uh, pulls in and it's there idling um, because it's quite an enclosed station. It's a low floor to ceiling and it's a long platform with a big concrete lid on there. So areas like that, we're looking at technologies where traditionally you just have big fans that take the emissions outside. If you take it out outside of the ambient in Birmingham, those that you know, it's actually a clean air zone there now. So it's not the right thing to do. So we're thinking, right, well, there's got to be a solution here. And then the innovation hat comes on and the frustration kicks in. And then we go out to the market and say, there's got to be something out there. So we speak to suppliers and we're now looking at um, an innovation technology like the one in, in the picture there, a company called Pluvo there, trying to be innovative in terms of latest filtration technology. Uh, ionization chemical processes that can capture emissions, filter them and, and produce cleaner at the other end. Um, and that's something, you know, air quality is a massive issue. Up to 40,000 premature deaths a year related to air quality. Before COVID, it was like the number one public health issue in this country. And it's a massive issue globally as well. So when we're looking at diesel exhaust emissions from trains, et cetera, and stations, again, we're thinking there's got to be better solutions out there. And we're engaging the market, we're giving them ideas, but those that even don't produce something like this, we're saying, have you considered something like this? And even during COVID, we found companies uh, that could manufacture filters that could capture COVID bacteria, et cetera, uh, within a lot of air handling plant and ventilation equipment as well. We rolled them out with Network Rail and, and others. Um, and then coming on to other sides in terms of going back to the carbon agenda, um, you'll be, I've told you some of the figures that we spend, the country spends as public money on the cost of running the network for railways, traction, non-traction, so we're looking at big assets, how can we decarbonize but make it more appealing? And we come up with solutions. So we'll, we'll be given a concept blank campus of a station. This is one in the Lake Districts in Oxen Hall for those that are familiar with Cumbria. And we were asked to look at a community style innovation um, and design that had some renewable technology would be a bit iconic and could enhance the station. And so we come up with some solutions like 
okay, could we make like a solar meadow? So we come with these solar tree concepts, and this is completely just blank canvas, just ideas that come across us, and we've, we've seen these in, in the United States. And we thought, okay, well, let's add some seats in there because people are waiting for trains. Um, and then let's look at different types of colors, LED lighting, and then how it works in terms of charging points. So we can have renewable technology that can be stored into a battery below the seat. You can plug your chargers in, your laptops while you're waiting for a train, and it's, and it's uh, renewable technology charging your phones. Um, and then we also then look at other, other problems that we get. And a lot of innovation is from problem solving, because a lot of what we do, we, we, get, we get problems thrown at us from clients like NetWorld and others. And one was a study where we are really trying hard on it uh, to work on for carbon neutrality. Stoke country, of course, you're familiar with Stoke, a uh, big, great, uh, one, two listed building. And with a lot of station buildings, you can't just throw solar panels on the roof and say, we're going to do this, going to do that. Very problematic in terms of its structure and weakness and lots of assurance of governance around what you can do on the railway because you cannot disrupt uh, a railway at all. If you disrupt a train of Birmingham, you can potentially disrupt 60% of the network. You can get fined something like £4,000 a minute. Um, and that's the kind of fines that we could see. So you cannot disrupt the railway and hence the whole assurance and governance piece around this. So we thought, okay, well, we can't put solar panels on the roof of the station. Can we put it on the car park then? And then they said, what do you mean by that? And we said, okay, let's do some research. So we go away, we find Bentley Motors in crew. Um, and they said, come and see us. So we went to see Bentley Motors. We took the client with us. And we said, there's got to be a solution to these problems. We've got to decarbonize. There's a bigger purpose. And there's obviously cost savings. Why don't we do a solar car port at Stoke? So Bentley Motors, we showed them the scheme. I think because it was a case of not being the first, because this is big risk stuff, big structures, and anything can happen. Uh, you don't want something like that collapsing on a new car in the car park or anything, you know, which we helped to ransom on this. And our heads will be rolling down the road here uh, or the railway. Um, so we wanted to see who else has done this before. Is it achievable? Is it cost effective? Early Motor said, yeah, absolutely, go and do it. So we went away. We then had meetings with Network Rail and and others, and they said, absolutely, yes, go ahead and do it. So again, one canvas, we did the design from concept, took it to detail design, and we come up with a way of, um, of making it work. It looks at battery storage technology. So when that energy is being produced, can it be stored in batteries and used for nighttime lighting? Because a lot of the railways use a lot of power during the night for lights and lifts and escalators. Then we 3D model it and look at what the solutions can bring. And then again, more in terms of innovation is looking at the carbon impacts of building something like this and the disruptions of passengers and commuters. So then we thought, can it be brought in big sections prefabricated offsite? So now if I hear in the, in the media, there's a big drive to prefabricated homes to bring the cost of developing and building homes less in prefabricated buildings. So we look at prefabricated solutions um, for, for uh, challenges like this as well. So in essence, yeah, it's, it, we, we enjoy it, everything we do because innovation is a big part and having that luxury, I guess, an opportunity, but luxury is the wrong word because it's not a real luxury when we have to do some of the hard work around it, but the opportunity with some of these clients is great for a small SME like us is looking to grow, grow for the right reasons of having a purpose, trying to be innovative, trying to keep local in terms of our growth as well. And also be as diverse as we can as well. Um, and we're very, very big on trying to be diverse and engage all different communities um, to attract different um, ideas and talents from everywhere. Um, so yeah, we've been fortunate to be recognized for some of that. But going back to technologies as well is we have to keep on top of the game, particularly in engineering solutions. We have this always innovation happening, it's always change. So one of the biggest issues we find is things are constantly shifting, particularly when it comes to sustainable solutions. One of them is smart technologies in. We'll find out a lot of equipment, even in your homes, your lights, uh, your TVs, et cetera. You know, you can, you can all link them up um, by voice activation and everything else. Um, and that's happening on a bigger scale now with buildings as well. So that's something we're trying to tap into, but looking at it again for a bigger purpose of sustainable development and looking at carbon and energy. So now going back to our scenario with train stations and, and what I said about the conditions we find where lights are left on and heating's left on. Can we, can we take that technology that we know is tried and tested and can we shift it into, into the railways and try and uh, adapt it there for the purpose of achieving uh, low carbon uh, infrastructure and, and stations? So we've again teamed up with a supplier and we've done a lot of the legwork around this. It's a company called Utopia, great, great company to work with in terms of innovative thinking. And they were traditionally in the student accommodation sector, residential. And we've again had, had discussions and said, well, 
can we adapt that technology into the rail sector? And I said, we never thought about this. So I spoke to their board and had lots of meetings. And now we're trialing this in the innovation fund, actually, um, to trial this across stations where you can get granular data, first that it's kind, but it can actually identify how much energy is being accumulated and used in a waiting room and in a foyer and in a ticket office. We've never, we've never had that kind of data before. We've never known that kind of data. Uh, and that's now being achieved through the work we're doing and trialing and testing uh, within the sector. And again, we get a lot of reports from out of this as well. We get all the details. And, we, and to a point where we can find that lights are being left on, we can see that through the night because there's a certain, certain level of lighting that's being maintained through the data we're gathering. But we can go back to the client and say, these lights, we're getting a constant 400 lux here. So this means the lights are being left on in a certain room or canteen or something overnight. So, oh yeah, we can see that, right? Let's do something about it. And we're getting data on waiting rooms. If they're overheating due to the heat wave, which we recently had, we were thinking, okay, well, wouldn't it be good if we had some blinds against the window and we did this and we can reduce the temperature, increase ventilation. So we come, it's a strategy-led means. But we're at a stage now where we're growing our team, we've got two of our key, key team players here today. And I've always been very big on trying to acquire graduates and empower them because I do feel that in big organizations where graduates enter into, they're almost like left to, you just do that bit there, just do that kind of question. Because I, I had that when I thought I was, I was a graduate for, for some years. Um, but I really throw them a bit in the deep end and within a month, they're the client facing and they really try to push them in terms of identifying solutions and challenge and um, really question the status quo, what's out there in terms of innovation. But there is challenges out there to get skilled resources at the moment, big, big challenge that many organisations will agree with me on that at the moment. Um, and retaining good people is a bigger, even bigger issue because you do get a lot of the big organisations that will just offer them and say come to us and we'll do this and we'll do that um, and then we're at a stage also when to scale up we now need to get into the big world and tendering and writing big bids and things and we're finding that we're teaming up with some big energy companies that come to us again great really really flattered that we, we've been approached by some of the big organizations to team up on certain tenders particularly within the railway but as i mentioned before training development keeping on top of technology in the shifting world and constant evolution advancements is one of the key issues and challenges we find. And therefore, most nights we're, we're up reading about what is the next thing that's coming up in terms of controls and innovation and sustainability um, in a shifting environment. So how do you for time? We've got okay for time. Um, key issue is, is innovation is key to grow. Uh, as Professor Bruce really well highlighted, is you can't just stay as you are and expect growth of a company, you expect profit. Um, but for us, as I mentioned, the purpose is just as big as the profit in the work that we do. Um, and that is key for us. And that's really where we, we, we try to strive to, to enforce that with our clients as well. And we also find that we're trying to do a culture change shift with them as well. So when we're producing a lot of these solutions and forwarding them, presenting them, we're also then talking about diversity, talking about social inclusion. We're talking about uh, fuel poverty and how we can do things in the community. And the organisations that we're working with are absolutely loving that, them ideas. We want to see more and hear more. Um, and that's again, because of the shift in culture we've seen with a lot of sh shareholders and owners of companies that want to go down the right path as well. Uh, and timing is key. You know, if, if, if I just left, just worked in a normal engineering role, something for years to years have gone by, I probably would have missed this opportunity to, to, to start this and fulfill what my dream is um, to create a, a real purpose-led organization. That still makes profit, but you have to be brave, be bold. I still remember when I started just then, I played in sleep for about a week thinking, am I doing the right thing? Because uh, on the verge of buying property and taking a mortgage and everything else. Um, so it, time was, was great, but it's never the right time. Uh, you've just got to take that step. And what I've also mentioned is keep learning and developing. For scaling up, you have to make sure training and development is top priority. Um, and that is absolutely key for scaling up. Um, and like with the railways and other sectors we're working in, you can't expect to achieve different results if you're doing the same thing again and again. And Albert Einstein was, was, was great in saying that. Um, some of our clients, um, you know, we're, we're really, again, flattered that we've got some, some high profile clients who are smaller than me that we are, um, and we are growing and looking to grow. Um, so I think just on, on time there. Okay, we're time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. That fantastic. Well, Mike, um, Bruce, back up if you want to see this art. Oh. Q and A up here. Hmm. That was fantastic. Yeah, very good. You two have been very busy. <laughs> <laughs>
Great. Well, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions, and then we'll um, we'll go to the room and online. Um, I'm just uh, as I was start with you because I loved your comment that you were seen as a disruptor or perhaps more of a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, in that uh, facing that kind of environment and the impacts resistance to innovation, how do you tackle that? Like, how do you get people on side? How do you get past that? Yeah, it's, it, it's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. I think in a situation that I gave as an example, that project at Birmingham, um, it was a case of sustainability was just now emerging as a key topic area. Mm -hmm. And the, the lucky thing for, for me at the time was a lot of the key funders realised that and they wanted more solutions around sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So for me, as a case of getting key stakeholders on board behind me, so they could then come in at higher levels and then penetrate kind of project level, say, no, no, he's talking sense, no, let's really do this. Mm -hmm. And I just had to position myself with some of them key stakeholders and almost have, you know, um, uh, uh, meetings um, outside of, you know, formal, formal uh, gatherings in there and just really, really just encourage that, that kind of thought process and culture change, really, that was the key, is to just change the mindset. Mm -hmm. But fortunate for me at the time, policies were changing, strategies were changing for big organisations. I never really knew they had to become more sustainable. So I was just on the verge of where this was becoming mainstream topic. Otherwise, to be honest, it wasn't that case. I probably would have struggled. I probably would have still been fighting today. Uh, but yeah, I was fortunate in that case. Okay. Are you are you finding less resistance moving forward? Are people getting, yeah. it's getting easier? Yeah, it's getting a lot easier. We get a lot more inquiries, a lot more yeah, engagement, really. Uh, but when I look back 10, 12 years ago, completely different environments where we are. Thank you. I'll uh, to the question for you, Bruce. You talked about doing the right projects and doing the projects well, if I have that right. Um, so how and when do you decide um, with that it's not going right? It's not the right project or it's not going well. How do you make those tough decisions and maybe you can weigh that as well? But... Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, so projects, so if it's drifting, right, if you're reducing your scope, I think you always got to try and remember what you're trying to achieve, right? So typically a project is, what do they say about projects? Tro project triangle, isn't it? That's on time, on budget, or scope, right? And so typically that gets uh, that gets reduced. So if you're starting to trim the project, uh, the features of the project, then it's no longer an attractive project, uh, an attractive product offer, right? So I guess you've got to go back and say, what is the what is the what is it we're really trying to achieve? What what can we not afford to, to take out of this? Mm -hmm. And you've seen that as well, making some of those tough decisions to perhaps move on, um, you know, change direction a little bit or make a tough call. Yeah, there is there is elements of that sometimes, but we're quite stubborn. So we had to uh, <laughs> we tried to convince the client well, when we're sure, and again, going back to that triple bottom line analogy, mm -hmm. if you know there's a business case for it, if you know you're going to make a positive environment impact uh, on the environment, and there is some social benefit as well, mm -hmm. you know, if we can tick down key boxes. That we really try and push and say, what the reason is to, to not do this? Mm -hmm. um, and if it is a case of those, the professor says that we can scope in or cost, sometimes we do get challenges and, and cost comes in as a big issue because a lot of the time we are dealing with public funds and they're always tight and always do get cut. Um, but if, this, if there's a benefit there, we find that the benefit is, is easy now to demonstrate because of the unfortunate increased cost of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, we do find that there's, there's less resistance now because we're demonstrating that trouble about mind, really. Um, which which is what we always got back to from a lot of our discussions. It sounds so. Uh, so a lot of the work, the more work you do up front, perhaps can improve the viability of the, of the project overall. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. another key is is understanding, as we've put really well, is understanding the client and their sensitivities. Mm -hmm. For example, in the railway sector, operating the trains is key. You know, you cannot be seen as being too innovative where you're not being sensible and you're not really being cognizant of the key risks around the railway infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So understanding the insurance, you know, we have to go to all these stage gate reviews, actually we're never real big on this. Every time we do a design, we go from concept to scheme, stage gate, scheme to detail design, stage gate, mm -hmm. and before you embark with contractors, another stage gate. Mm -hmm. So we're very familiar with that area and territory. And for us, the key is understanding the client sensitivities. And it's very different in social housing, they'll have different sensitivities around cost mm -hmm. uh, and program and contractors and skills. Um, but I think key is understanding what the pinch points of sensitivities are and then work around them, but always keep them top of the agenda. You have to always go back to your risks. Mm -hmm. And if you're seen as, as drifting from them risks and almost ignoring them, thinking, oh, you'll be all right on the night kind yeah. of approach, then you, you, you're getting, you're setting yourself up for failure there. Great. Great. 
I love seeing the theory and the practice coming together beautifully. That's nice to see. <laughs> I'll uh, just check out the room here. Any questions in the room? One from the online audience. Okay, great. So, um, and then we'll go to the late night. Yeah, go ahead. So Gary Young has asked, um, do you follow any best practice for the identification, consideration, and introduction of innovation? And if yes, can you share details or examples? Well, that's what we were trying to say earlier, <laughs> from all that sense. Of, I, I mean, I suppose one of the things that's quite difficult about best practice is that I think best practice varies with where you are in your ability to innovate. So, I mean, I think things like StageGate is quite a basic tool, right? But it's a kind of beginner's tool. So it's a bit like, you know, learning a sport, right? You wouldn't want to probably learn a sport off a uh, of, so I've got just a federal of tennis because it's too good, right? So you, you kind of build it up. So I think best practices are not absolute. They, I think they tend to be depend on where you are in your innovation journey. I mean, you guys sound like you're innovating a lot, you've experienced at it, whereas other businesses will be very occasional innovators. So I think the best practice for an occasional, rare innovator is different from a continuous innovator, right? Just as a sports person would be kind of find it, you know, would use different tools to a beginner. Yeah, I think for, for us, um, I won't say we, we, we don't follow any kind of textbook on innovation at all, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of the ideas are very different because we're with different clients, different scenarios, in a completely different atmosphere, project to project, different sensitivities, different sets of risks. So to be honest, we don't, we don't follow any textbook on innovation. Do you think following textbook would be a negative impact on innovation? Because it's... You can constrain yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think indirectly, you are following a lot of the guidance that Professor Booth actually talked about, um, and then stage gates and, and you know whether you want to kill something that's gone too long or you don't. I think indirectly, some of the things you talked about, actually, I've been thinking about, well, we're actually doing that, we're, we're prolonging this, and I'll probably go back tomorrow and, and think about a lot of these things, um, because it is easy to just start on something and you just keep it going for the sake, and you really need to have that realisation. Is there a case for it? Is there a benefit for it? Will ultimately somebody take this forward and take it on uh, for a good reason? Um, if there isn't, there's no real point then in taking it further. It sounds like trying to maintain some objectivity, which can be very difficult when you're very close to a project. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Is it personal? But it's, it's a question that yeah, I was yeah. just curious. We always concentrate on client satisfaction. Uh, so, um, in terms of uh, strikes for several several months. Uh, also, businesses are very concentrated on uh, productivity and effectiveness of employees. How do you see um, innovation uh, to impact the employee satisfaction uh, and less strikes in right away? Do you see any possibility for this as well? For, for the railway, the strikes, I think, is, is quite a different kind of scenario and what's going on with the unions and obviously salaries, etc. Yeah. In terms of satisfaction, though, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because I actually had a call with somebody in the Middle East uh, a couple of days ago about how sustainability can link with health and well-being and, and, and satisfaction in the workplace. And we're looking at doing elements of work where some of the projects that did show it today, but we're looking at things like green wall technologies, how can green walls and planting can help and biodiversity, but also help someone's well-being when they're at the workplace. Sometimes client satisfaction on the railway can be they're working in a dark, dingy train station every day. You know, they're exposed to emissions and diesel exhaust and things. So they're the kind of things that we're trying to tackle to make sure there's a bit more satisfaction in the workplace around that. The, 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 the concept we showed you in the railway with the trees and, and, and the solar panels on there, that is part of that as well to try and create a more appealing station for people to not just work, work in, but commuters and passengers. So indirectly, we're working towards that area of greater satisfaction in the workplace by more attractive stations by making them more sustainable but unfortunately the, the bigger issues around strikes we we don't have that power as a small company to try and uh, no, yeah uh, solution reasons yeah 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 no I, I understand what you mean so a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, one is that um, sometimes innovation is disruptive to people's work patterns. So, I mean, for example, I was, te talk I was teaching my students about Procter & Gamble, right, last, uh, last week. And they changed the way they innovated from being dependent on their own R&D 
production, basically, to being sourcing ideas outside. And that made the internal people worry, right? Oh, does Procter & Gamble no longer need us? Are they, we're going to get replaced. Uh, I mean, innovation is, can be disruptive to what people do. And what we know about people is that people who lose things tend to complain a lot. And people who gain things often don't say very much, right? So they're quite quietly happy that they, their situation is improving, whereas the people who are losing out moan like hell. So I guess you, you know, I think your previous answer to another question was like how you kind of got stakeholders aboard and took that, that forward. So I think that I think we have to recognize that innovation does involve change and often people aren't going to be happy about it. Um, but I guess you have to push those things through sometimes. The other thing that occurred to me is I was remembering that I did, we did some, we had this kind of, it was an airline, right? And they were trying to change the way in which they provided their on, on flight services. And they, I remember the, the manager telling me really important to have the the the, the um, kind of staff, right? The air hostesses, the hosts involved in the process. Because unless you have them involved in the process, they kind of resist it. You've got to try and make it their process as well as your own. So don't just, you know, it's kind of just impose all the solutions on people. You've got to bring them with you. Yeah. Um, we'll here and then another. Some questions from the online okay, audience. Online. Great, yeah. And um, so, two questions kind of linked in together. Uh, so, Paul Cochran asked, Is agile methodology better than stage gates? And that kind of links into what Mohammed Reyes asked whether a stage gate process should incorporate the feedback loops. So I'd say that I would start with the stage gates and move to agile. So that was kind of what I was trying to say about being a beginner, then move up, right? So yeah, learn the basic tool and then get a bit more sophisticated. So should it involve feedback loops? Well, when it, if it means it is meant that it has loops to go back to previous stages, then yes, it should. Do. So I just presented a very simplified version of the concept there. But yes, it can. It certainly can do. Yes. <laughs> John over here. Uh, hi, uh, my name's John. I work for the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre. And I want to talk about the adoption of new material technologies. Looking at some of your clients up there, we work with Aaron, for example, where they've adopted new technologies, but it's in a de risk situation. Uh, really interested in your talk about adopting technology in large scale infrastructure projects. Obviously, uh, once I could focus on low carbon temperatures around some cementitious materials. But what's your view on uh, the stakeholders in the supply chain adopting new technologies, especially around where standards and verifications have got to be verified? Which is this is where one of the challenges that we're seeing is the adoption of, for example, the design of new cements, where it doesn't have the historic a certification that the industry requires for de risking large scale projects. But again, what's your experience in the adoption of new technology where certification is required? Can you, can you share any experiences about yeah. how that is adopted? It's, it's, yeah. it's a fairly big challenge that we see largely. I'm in, in, I'm in material science, so I apologize, I'm not a business developer, but it is about the upscale of the technologies, which is just as important as organization change. So yeah. it alludes to what Professor Bree said before, it's more about product development. We appreciate we've got to go through the scalability, and we're in that uh, role at the University of Manchester with delivering the project. But it's about the, the adoption of that technology on a large scale infrastructure projects. If you can go and share any. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great you've actually mentioned graphene because I um, was on a call only last week with uh, a company that's looking at graphene technology in paints. That can then improve their quality by absorbing oxygen and CO2. I don't know whether you're aware of this. Yes, but, um, so there's many uh, technologies of where graphene is used. It's not just, yeah, not, not, we don't call it the pixie dust, it's how you apply in the technology. Yes. Fire retardants is one area, right? Low carbon construction, asphalt is all there. Yeah, yeah. The anti corrosion. So there's many applications where all we come up against the same standards by adoption. <laughs> Verification, verification yeah. yeah, yeah. So, especially the EM side. Yeah, so it, it is, I'll be honest, in the rail sector, it's very tough because a product approval process is, is very, very stringent. Um, a lot of the ways we want to get around this but get to approval verification is have the trial period. So we try to get a small sum of money that's from the innovation fund or something. We'll, we'll go through the competition process and everything. We do all the applications. 
I say just let us trial an area. And if it can trial an area demonstrating it's there for six months, eight months, not saying with what we're planning with the air filtration equipment, rather than going all out, all scale and big scale. Because you, I do want a small example on some of the smart technologies I mentioned, even with something like that, the product's process and approval process is very stringent. And one reason is you take station radios, for example, GSMR. You know, is there a risk that some of the languages and some of the you know um, interaction with the technology that we're using can that interact with some station radio and can disrupt it? Shouldn't do, but there's always a risk. And it's, it's just questions like that will be thrown at you from some comms engineer or something. It has, it has to go through that process. It is very challenging, I'll be honest. And I think that's one of the issues where that sector that we're working has been quite slow and take up. Um, but it's it's a case of going through that pain. You know, we're prepared to do that. And I think probably one of the benefits of a small organization is we've got that probably ability to be more agile and be a bit more patient um, because the win would be massive for something like us, whereas bigger organizations, that's one of many probably that they're trialing. Um, so if the answer is, is very difficult. I think with our engineering background, though, we can very quickly home in on what the issues would be and what the risks would be. Um, and even with the solar medal I mentioned, showed you on there, the amount of questions that have been thrown at us for that, you know, we're at this stage now, detail design going into construction. Yeah, we're, um, very, so, yeah. we're very interested in that, the understanding of the RP you were talking about, but that represents, I what you just said, is a lot of the small SMEs are actually far more agile. Uh, to adopt these technologies and then give them some big infrastructure to the big firms and where they can talk about this. Yeah. But we are we are engaged in those small trials with the it's trying to get into the large infrastructure, which is really where the key savings are, especially for sustainability. So yeah. It's quite quite interesting what you're saying. Yeah, no, it's been, definitely we'll, we'll catch up after but be, but the technology like that we're just finding to start small, do a trial period, and that in itself will make product approval verification a lot easier. Because it's rather than going full scale. It sounds like the approval process could use some innovation. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that could be another business for you. Yeah. More questions in the room or online? I've got another one to get fire away. Yes, please. About the people uh, in your company. You mentioned that uh, you struggled to recruit, I mean, the recruitment and the uh, meeting. <laughs> Staff is very important, and uh, that is also linked to uh, how valuable are uh, the younger people to the generation of innovation. So, what type, type of skills you're looking for, and uh, how difficult it is to find the skills that you need, and what happens when they leave? So, when they leave, uh, I cry. <laughs> you know, it's, it can be very upsetting because I've got a lot of you know, hard work and a lot of time and effort into, into, into them. Um, but for me, as, as I mentioned uh, in the talk, is, um, is empowering a lot of our young graduates and youth, uh, particularly in climate action, because you know, it's the younger generation that are gonna suffer more than we are. Um, so for us, what we're doing and the projects we're working on, I find that a lot of the graduates are really putting their you know, heart into it because they really care. And I think that's a very important part of really enjoying what you do um, and having a purpose about what you do. And not just all about profit, and that's what I think. Generally, I think there's a lot of studies around this area now, where a lot of uh, yeah, a lot a lot of workforce are more happy when they can see a wider purpose of what they do, particularly in the climate action uh, realm. Um, but yeah, it's, it is very difficult, particularly where I think there's a skill shortage at the moment. I'm very surprised that there's not enough courses at the moment around low carbon technology. I think recent studies are showing school leavers only 50 percent of school leavers have had a big awareness around climate action and climate uh, and renewable technologies. Um, and that really needs to be increased. Um, I'm quite lucky that I guest lecture uh, in Manchester University for a master's course in low carbon technology. So I sometimes go to the professor and say, who's your best pick of graduates this year? <laughs> and to be honest, those that you see here are from that process. Um, so I don't go out to you know, recruitment consultants or agencies to say, you've got, um, I, I do it slightly clever, whether that's fully legal, I hope it is, just let it on, <laughs> on, 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 a, on a, in an open forum. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, we just get applications come to us random as well. You know, um, since certain lectures or forums will be in flight today, I'll just get a CV the next day and say, you know, I'm really keen to, to work for you or this, I've got a big interest. And the biggest tick in the box for me is they've showed an interest as soon as they show a big interest, for me, they're almost 50% there. The next is about the credentials and, you know, keenness and, and, their, and their personalities, et cetera. 
to me, it's all about willingness to learn. Unfortunately, there is a lot of people out there that just think they, they deserve it because they've got a good degree or their background, a privileged background or something. You know, it's not about that. It's not about that. We want to be as diverse as possible. We want to make sure we go into the communities that I feel are not represented, particularly in terms of climate action. And they're the communities that are going to suffer the most in climate change. You know, the urban, densely populated communities, even around Greater Manchester, I feel they don't have as big a voice. I feel they don't get the opportunities. I feel, you know, I was in that kind of space as well when I was a youngster. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there is prejudices out there. There is stereotypes out there. And we really want to break them barriers in the way we grow and be as diverse as possible. And that's a big, big issue for me because I feel we don't tap into all the communities equally and therefore we're missing out on gathering thoughts and ideas from a whole, you know, a whole community. You tend to just see if you go to board level still now in all the big organisations and railways, one of them, on an operational level, you'll see a very diverse set of people, but you're going to a railway station you do see diversity. When you go to board level and you present there, unfortunately, you don't see anything like that. It's very underrepresented. Um, so unfortunately, that is, I feel that's still the case. These organisations do recognise that now, but I don't feel there's really a plan there to change it. And for me, I just feel like I'm in a fortunate position now. You know, we're a small entity. We're going into schools. We're going to colleges. You know, we're doing that now down south with a client in Oxford who really understands the importance of diversity and inclusion. And we've put a set of slides together. Yara's done that with us and lovely. And uh, we're going soon to, to go to talk to 14, 15 year olds and even younger to talk about climate change action. But the fact that it's everyone's problem, it's not just a case of few privileged that will be empowered and get into jobs where they can make that difference. It's everyone's issue and everyone's got an opportunity because this will be a growing sector and this can help in terms of emerging growing economies. So yes, I'll probably give you a very long answer then. <laughs> but then you know, it's a, I hope that answers what you're asking. Um, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, we've got a, I work for a company that's quite a large m and contract and one of our clients, um, a big international drugs company. And they've challenged us basically this week to give a presentation against, um, basically planning to put multiple biomass projects Across the globe, we've got 10 billion pounds to spend on it. They're really focused on just doing biomass to right. reduce their dreams. One of the challenges we mainly work in Nigeria with them, right? And we're looking at basically the source of you know the agri waste that they're doing for it. They don't have the data to work with the local farmers to implement that to know if it's working or not. So the main question is how do you adapt to those developing economies and situations with those multinational companies? by them the data in that scenario. Great question. That's a great project to work on. Um, <laughs> it is. I mean, the biomass obviously going to have issues with security of supply um, and also sourcing of supply. But you might have the data initially, but solutions like, for example, to give you is create them innovation solutions now. And what say, okay, you hear Rockwell Automation? Who? Rockwell Automation. Mm -hmm. um, they've developed something really similar called Pinsworks. Right. So it's basically energy monitoring technology we can adapt it link it to the web and what you demonstrate is very similar. Okay. Well the, the data is now in certain um environments. That's the main issue. And indeed projects basically Africa based got these. This one is Nigeria, Mexico, Indonesia. Wow. And I think Yeah. And with something like that. You probably want to do desktop study first and go and speak to the supply chain mm -hmm. and see you know who is the suppliers that you go to or would want to use and then go and speak to them initially and, and do some real real intrusive investigations around sources of biomass and who they use and how it's created and sourced from etc um, and to me you'd have to be some really old school kind of research first in depth and then gather that to so desktop study then then go into the detail around and how can we then capture this and create some sort of certification processes. Um, and they might get mandated in, in areas like Nigeria, for example. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think outside the box there and think, right, let's really go big here. Because gosh, we have clients like that, I'd be all over it, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a big challenge. It's a great opportunity. But go intrusive really and speak to them and say, right, we want to know who you're considering. Get, get, go and speak to them. Well, if you've got time later, you know, you can go and speak to the client. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Absolutely. 
<laughs> I could grow on the back of that even more. Then. <laughs> so I've got to scale up for it. It's all about. <laughs> Perfect. Do you have any more questions online? Yeah, got a question online from Gemma. Um, can long term planning for large complex organizations be harmonized to short term agile mindsets to achieve innovation? <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you got to, you know, it's, it's some journey, isn't it? So you're, you're, you've got a long-term goal. So how are you going to get there? So break it down into stages and do it uh, bit by bit. And I suppose that's what I would intuitively think is the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with large organisations, a lot of them have a lot of resources and capital behind to innovate and, and create that plan and create their plans. Um, for smaller ones like us. To be honest, a lot of it is kind of trial and error. You know, what if we see a need, and uh, then we'll, we'll go for it. Um, but I think we do have the agility, though, to adapt and uh, with, with clients quite quickly and, and jump on certain key, key challenges and issues. But to be honest with you, we haven't set a strategy out, certainly nothing like in them slides to say, this is what we're going to go because there's such, such a shifted pattern in, in the work that we do. Yeah. yeah. More on I mean, that's partly because I mean, in larger organizations, there's a test, tends to be more separation between the sort of strategic activities and the more operational activities, right? Yeah. So in a small organization, they can be matched together. But in a large organization, there's kind of separation. So you, you typically have like this, but, yeah, the board in charge of long term direction and then how to implement that or, or trickle down. Good question. Good. good. <laughs> Uh, so another question, which I hope it'll be, but I'll throw it out there. <laughs> so Bruce, you were talking earlier about, um, I mean, it was one in five UK companies have mm -hmm. sort of innovated in the past mm -hmm. handful of years. Um, definitely a very low number. Um, so my question to both of you is, how do we fuel or inspire or motivate more innovation in these companies that, for whatever reason, are not, are not doing it now? Because obviously we need more. Yeah, it's surprising, isn't it? So I think I think that they need to understand better how to manage innovation in a very basic way. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think if we had a very, we disseminate um, how to innovate. So if you look at things like the innovation objective of target of 2.5% R&D, that's all great, but it doesn't tell us how to get there, does it? It doesn't, how, doesn't tell us how we're going to get to increasing R&D to do not. Percent. So for me, I think there's lots of kind of basic ways to, to innovate. That's why I'm a big fan of design and develop, mm -hmm. because I think you can use lots of design tools. Uh, it's trying to understand, you know, what is the challenges that your clients are facing, try to incorporate that into development. And so if you do break it down, sort of demystify innovation, make it more of a kind of routine practice that can be done. Mm -hmm. They use tools like the, uh, the, the the business model canvas is a great tool, right? So, I mean, I'm presuming that companies don't innovate, A, because they don't have to, and B, because they're kind of worried that innovation is somehow some scary thing that they're going to waste their money on, right? So if you can if you can sort of see how they could, if you can help them, inform them, A, it's not that scary, right? If you do the right projects and you do them well, you should benefit, and uh, you get the, the outcome. I mean, obviously, yeah, as you were saying, it's not necessarily just for growth and profit, it may be for purpose, right? So what are you trying to achieve and how can innovation help you achieve that? But if we can demystify it, I think that will go a long way to uh, increasing the rate of which we have Yeah, and I think funding pots are a big uh, issue as well, because I know the likes of Innovate UK and other similar kind of uh, pathways to try and acquire funding to innovate. We've gone for applications and it can take a long time, be really, really difficult. And then at the end, you get this hard because you've come closer, you've not got then you spent hours and hours and days on this. Um, and the other the other aspect is um, is having client backing as well. So if you're not going for funding from any grant funds or anything, is um getting client endorsement, maybe you might you know have a fund there that you can tap into in a big organization or a big public uh, company. Um, which which can be, but they're very they're very few and far between. Mm -hmm. I think if there's more pots of them available, even on small projects, we could do small trial. With gentleman mentioned about you know kind of um, issues around verification and product approval. We just do something small scale, but it has some funding behind it. Mm -hmm. Then I think there'd be more innovation. But it is concerning because I think as a country, I've loved my history. For me, the civilizations that have prospered, the ones that have always innovated, but that militarily. Civilian civilization and technology is key. You have to do 
you have to keep moving forward and innovating. And I think it, it, there's a risk we'll fall behind uh, if we don't continue to do that. And it's just, just having ideas, sharing ideas, uh, it's a good start. Yeah. I want to uh, say that not just around um, the idea of collaboration. You mentioned a lot of projects within those collaborations with suppliers uh, to innovate on the solution. What about innovating with others? So others, other cross industry, cross you know um, public private partnerships, yeah. um, maybe maybe with a potential competitor um, or someone that's outside of your space. Um, what can either of you comment about on on that and sort of broadening that? You know, collaborating with others for ideas and innovation and development and efficiency. Oh and yeah, such. Uh, collaboration is, is, is massive. But mm -hmm. what, I mean, uh, portals like LinkedIn is great. So sometimes you don't find the right collaborations. I think for, for, for us, is we often reinvent the wheel of look at innovation. And what we don't often find is what's going on in other sectors. So what we started to do is, okay, we're predominantly rail, but we go to the healthcare sector and see what, what good practice they're doing. And one idea is looking at power purchase agreements, lease agreements, third party funding on big renewable projects. So because nothing done in rail, you like, well, asked on it, we went to the health sector, we've got some suppliers in on board there that we're having discussions with. The example I showed about the energy monitoring, they are big, as I mentioned, in the residential uh, sector, particularly in student accommodation. Mm -hmm. They've never done rail, but we knew that that technology could be adapted really well. So for us, it's definitely don't always have to reinvent the wheel, go out to suppliers that have been completely different markets. And what we've done is actually we picked, picked up the phones there, and it came through a mutual client we're working with um, outside of the rail sector, residential. And he um, just said, Oh, I think I want to speak to these guys, picked up the phone, had a chat, and they were like, We've never thought of rail. Yeah, it'd be great to work with you, you know. And then that went to their board, and the board said, "Great, another market could be there for us, you know." Um, so yeah, definitely, I think we we make mistakes of trying to reinvent the wheel. We should always look at what other sectors are doing in expertise. And mm -hmm. um, Bentley Motors was a great example on solar car. Of course, we went to car manufacturer again, completely outside our rail sector, mm -hmm. but they were doing implementing something that we thought could be adapted um, to not just one station, but thousands of stations in the future. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think the collaboration cross sector is key for innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so much of it, I think, is involves moving something that works in one context into another context. Mm -hmm. right? It's really, I think, we're, we're again, sort of the mystification problem, right? People think it's about invention and then doing something clever, inventing something, and then then they think hey, that's the hard bit, right? But there's a lot of innovation. So one way, okay, so here's a bit, this, I'll try this idea with you, but um, may or may not work. So one way you can think about sort of technology space is that it, technology is a bit like building blocks, like Lego, right? So yeah, if you build, if, and, we, and it takes a lot of energy to produce a new building block, right? And as we, and the point is that as you combine building blocks, the opportunity space becomes very big, right? And the point is, as we grow the number of building blocks available, possibility space to combine existing building blocks absolutely becomes enormous, right? Much larger than it is the invention of the new building block, right? And for me, that's the message I want to kind of make about innovation is that so much is about refining new combinations of things which work well or putting things which work well from one context into another context, or even doing fairly basic things like finding out where people are like leaving the lights on finding a solution to that you know, so a lot of it is kind of very low level and if you like even mundane right but it's important and impactful and so rather than sort of start with a big uh challenging must invent something new kind of mindset it's really starting at the bottom right mm -hmm. it's starting to look at how we can improve things where are the points of pain where are the gains to be made and solving those problems Right. Back to those innovation myths you were talking about, and you don't Absolutely. need to be the first mover, you don't need the big idea, you can no, iterate no. off what's there no. for sure. Yeah, fantastic. Great. I'll just check in again online and in the room. Okay, I've got a couple more questions, and we are just about to wrap up. Um, but I, I want to pick up there was an earlier question about uh, it's come up a lot about skill and hiring for innovation. Um, but what about existing workforces and training for, for innovation? Um, comments from either of you on that, people that might might be resistant or just don't have the experience or, you know, um, how, do you, how do you train for innovation? I mean, there's two elements to that. One is the technical training around the areas that you're working, mm -hmm. and then that creates some thought process around resolving certain key issues that clients might forward via innovation. The other aspect for that, I think, is uh, the mindset in creating an organisation 
that has a culture of sharing ideas and innovation. So if you create that culture where you know the leadership endorses ideas and they may be the silliest of ideas um, that may not go anywhere, but the fact is creating that culture that, that you know is is it's okay to share ideas no matter how crazy they are. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that's that's definitely two aspects of that in any organization that will help develop that kind of innovative thinking. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important also to think about hiring, you know, having people who are adaptable in that sense, right? And hiring people who can adapt. I always remember there was some so there was an old study as some data study now, but it was a kind of an interesting study which compared um textile manufacturing in, in Germany with textile manufacturing in Britain, right? And uh, so this is a bit of an old study, so but it, it kind of makes the point about skills, right? So apparently the British workers were not able to read instructions, right? They were not able to follow instructions. So the, so what happened was that they, they were basically given one uh, piece of item to make, right? And then they made this in large batches because they weren't adaptable. Right. Whereas the German workers were each allowed, were each given different instructions, okay, and therefore were to making different products. Each each worker was essentially making a different product, and the changeover from product to product was very much easier. Right, the adaptability was higher. Of course, this leads you to be active in very different markets, right? Because one is in a market of mass manufacturing, you know, low cost, right, and the other is in fast changing. It's much more agile. So this, the nat- so the nature of the skills was crucial for the ability of the firm to do different things and be adaptable, right? I'm not quite sure that it entirely holds now, but I still think our our education system isn't great at creating adaptable skills, especially you know amongst the uh, many people who aren't lucky enough to go to university or get higher education, right? In a sense, our our skills problem is not this side of the education. Yeah. Divide, right? So we're good. we've always been good at the top bit. It's the it's the a lot of other workers who are much, it's much more challenging for. Which is a much bigger population. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll just um, maybe ask for sort of as a as the last question slash closing remarks um, from you both. So the the purpose of our forum here today was around um, achieving innovation, discussing strategies to effectively facilitate innovation in the fast growing business. Um, so I'm going to end with the beginning. Where does a company start if they want to get onto this path uh, and they're trying to be faster in business? They want to innovate. What's that simple thing they can start with, or where do where do they begin, or begin again? Maybe. I think one of the strap lines of thought there was uh, "be brave and be bold." Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. Well, I think it's about finding out what you're about. So that in this particular case, it's about combining a sort of passion for sustainability with achieving a profit path, right? So that defines your that defines your space to a large extent, right? And then you innovate within that space. So that that guides you to where you want to go. It guides you around the things you're going to be acceptable for you to do and mm-hmm. things that are not going to be acceptable for you to do. Another company might take a completely different idea about what it's seeking to achieve, and therefore its outcomes are different. So you know, I guess if there's one takeaway from me, it's kind of play around with those uh, that, that uh, business model campus idea, right? You really can play with that and think about what it is that we do, reflect on what you do, how you do it, how you can change what you do, right? How you can improve upon what you do and, uh, and implement those changes. I guess it's be brave, be bold and play around. Well, thank you, thank you both. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone in the room, and you can learn the world help today and online. Um, and don't forget to see everyone the next scale up event. Thank you very much. Very good. Wow, it's really good. Lovely to meet you. Inspiring.